Welcome to Byju's IAS classes and we are back again with yet another edition of our weekly review of international affairs. As we have been discussing in past, there are times when international events change very fast, uh, power equations between major powers change and they have an impact not only in their relations but all over the world. And this is what we have been witnessing recently. President Biden announced that he is going to withdraw the American troops from Afghanistan, latest by 9-11 this year. And this has created a very interesting situation. Afghanistan, which seemed to be heading towards stability when the Taliban uh, talks with the Taliban at Doha were announced, suddenly seems to have become a, a very, very fluid situation again. Also, we have been witnessing what some call a beginning of a second Cold War with the potential of a third world war exploding out of it. The Russia's massing more than 100,000 troops uh, on the Ukrainian border and the American president trying to uh, tell the Russians to back off at the same time uh, offering him a summit level talks. So we are left a little bit confused. What is this policy of blow hot and blow cold mean? Uh, in the past also several times in Afghanistan the date line has been shifted. Is it going to be a similar case this time? All this we shall discuss and all these are very important issues. Before we begin our analysis of President Biden's decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Afghanistan and its impact on international relations, I think it would be very useful to have a historical retrospective on how Afghan crisis has emerged. The first thing which we must never forget is that Afghanistan is a landlocked country, a small landlocked country, but it has a great strategic significance. It has historically always provided a gateway to the fabulous riches of India to any foreign invader. You can go back to the time of Alexander's invasion and you can follow the route subsequently all the way down to Mughals and you have this uh, land route for foreign invaders heading towards India through Afghanistan. It also borders Iran, a great historical civilization, which has interests with certain tribal communities here. Uh, it also, uh, after a partition, has merged into Pakistan, uh, borders merged into Pakistan. The Doran line remains very controversial, but we'll come to that later. I think there are certain myths about Afghanistan which have been perpetuated in historical studies. One is that the Afghans are a graveyard of foreign invaders. They are invincible. They got the better of the British imperialists. They got the better of the uh, Russian imperialists. And now they have defeated, uh, in a humiliating manner, the Americans. So all the major imperial powers or great powers or superpowers have failed in Afghanistan. How true is this? Or is it that all these countries have tried to glamorize their own role, own intervention in Afghanistan and have given mythological accounts of their dealings with uh, Afghanistan? And the invincibility of Afghanistan is not due to some extremely superhuman capacities for warfare, but because when one country uh, tries to occupy or invade Afghanistan or become influential, uh, the rivals, equally powerful, support opposing factions and this is something which we must keep in mind because it's of very direct relevance in present times. The second thing which we forget is that the national identity, what goes by the name of national identity of Afghanistan is actually identity of a people belong to different tribes and their primary loyalty, primordial loyalties are to their tribes and they have a tradition of violent revenge, Pakhtun, Wari and Badal, without getting into details of this is that they never forget a slight is uh, eye for eye, tooth for tooth and the blood debt concept is there. Now, Afghanistan has never actually crystallized as a nation state. Forget about the modern nation state. And when we are told about the great game which the British played, uh, Rudyard Kipling glamorized it, glorified it in his uh, books. Uh, it gives us the impression that the British had very skillful diplomacy and they kept at bay the rival empire of the Tsarist Russia uh, on the other side. This continues uh, in the First World War period, post World War period and you say that when there was a monarch uh, in Afghanistan, uh, these feudal chieftains were still there, they were warring. but. Uh, the, the king of Afghanistan played one side against the other, the Germans against the Russians against the British and managed to retain some kind of independence. But the fact remains that modern nation state status has always 
eluded Afghanistan. Without getting bogged up too much in distant past, we must say that the problem really began about uh, three to four decades back when after the Cold War, the Russians thought that the time was ripe to make a foray into Afghanistan. They thought that there were enough people in Afghanistan supporting Marxism, communist parties, different factions, and they could take over and get the better of whatever the British had claimed they had done during the Great Game period. So in 1979, the Soviet invasion and occupation of Afghanistan began. It lasted for about 10 years. Now, why the Soviets lost is not only because the Afghans were invincible, but it is because the Americans, the American intelligence agency CIA, in league with the Pakistani army and the Pakistani intelligence agencies ISI, trained a crop of fanatical Afghans and Pakistanis called Talibans, and these were let loose to uh, dislodge the Soviets, the godless regime of communists, from the Kabul. Now, they are also fighting between the factions of communist parties. Uh, the Soviets changed their support and loyalty and patronage from one to another. That's one part. The second part is that right now, uh, when the warring uh, factions take, the warlords control poppy uh, crops and so on, everybody says that this has always been there. But let us not forget, this drug trade, this illicit trade, trade in drugs, uh, growing of poppy, uh, making of opium, illicit trade in arms is directly related to the policy of weakening the Soviet soldiers in Afghanistan and it has been pointed out very uh, brilliantly by some western scholars themselves that the Americans should look inside and find out that isn't it the drug addiction in the United States and other western countries which encourages this kind of a illicit trade, contraband trade in drugs in Afghanistan, in uh, Myanmar, uh, Golden Triangle area in Southeast Asia, in Colombia and elsewhere in Latin America. So we must keep this in mind that for this too, the Afghans themselves are not responsible. Then after 10 years, when Mikhail Gorbachev took over, he had a word of wisdom. He realized that it was not very wise to uh, bleed continuously and stay in Afghanistan, he decided to withdraw. And he gave this advice to the Americans that the priority should be to leave the Afghans alone uh, and not try to meddle in their affairs directly. This led to a period after uh, the Soviet empire was dismantled, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev lost power himself, but what he had initiated in the process continued. For some time, the Russians continued to support the regime in Kabul, so there was a lease of life which the government had there, but slowly uh, the civil war-like situation spread and uh, the, it was a contest between Mujahideens and Talibans. Now obviously the Mujahideens were who got rid of the Soviets, started a 10-year regime of brutality, violence, fundamentalism, intolerance, going back to medieval ages. Now this is interesting because at some time a scholar made a very interesting statement. He said that Talibans were welcome initially by the Afghan people because they were less brutal, less vengeful, less dogmatic than the Mujahideens. But is there much to choose between the two? We can make up our mind a little later, but then what happened is that in, at that stage, the Americans started supporting the Taliban to get rid of the, of the Mujahideens in Kabul. Uh, there were suppression of human rights, the women rights were violated, uh, there was revenge, there was a proliferation of violence, but after another decade, the Taliban could be ousted. Now what led to this again is the date which Biden's announcement underlines, 9-11. On 9-11, Al-Qaeda uh, Islamic terrorist group had mounted attack on Twin Trade Towers in New York. Thousands of people died and the Americans vowed revenge and decided to track the mountain rat who they call Osama bin Laden and who was taking shelter in Afghanistan and was uh, given a sanctuary by the Taliban to get rid of him. Now, this was no holes bar attack. This also shifted the focus from regime change in Iraq, which could be accomplished, but Americans had bogged down there in large numbers, they are facing resistance. So if a new front was opened in Afghanistan, and this would placate the American public opinion and say that justice had, retribution had been done, justice had been done in Afghanistan. This boast of uh, tracking down Osama and bringing him to book took almost a decade or more. 
it could not be done in Bush's time. It was only accomplished in Obama's presidency. But the fact remains that all this process, uh, which has turned out to be the longest war in American history, has exposed two things. It has exposed A, that high-tech weaponry, however sophisticated, however much it may be complicated uh, and for the exclusive use of Americans, is not very relevant, effective in the context of a society which lives at a primitive stage. Uh, you can't destroy cities, you can't disrupt, have cyber attacks on complicated information systems and people go back to uh, caves and rocks and things of that, that kind and they have lived a life of uh, very primitive subsistence and they are not really worried about these, this sophisticated weaponry. The second thing it exposes is the limits of a superpower like America that you might plow in billions of dollars, you might have hundreds of thousands of people on the ground. You can control territory, but you cannot bring the people to either appreciate the virtues of Western style democracy or to support a friend who has saved them from a predator Taliban or a Mujahideen. Now, ever since this intervention in Afghanistan at the turn of the new century, they, we have seen another story coming. No government in Kabul has been able to win a mass base or support. Uh, warring warlords have carved out the country in different territories. They fight amongst themselves. They uh, change sides as they do. And they have no ideological commitment or no ethical value. Some of them are particularly uh, sadistic, uh, like Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, and also the Americans trying to put people who are non-resident Afghanis educated in the United States of America and think that they would win support in Afghanistan has proved to be counterproductive. I think this is there is a lesson in this all this for India also, because India at times thought uh, that uh, uh, when Karzai was the president who had been a student in India, he would be, because of this exposure, more friendly and sympathetic to India. So you have a situation where they, at the top of the political leadership in Afghanistan, whether it is Ashraf Ghani versus Abdullah Abdullah, who are contending for the top place, who accuse each other of uh, influencing elections uh, indirectly, illegally, etc. And they only have their writ confined to the Kabul. And even within Kabul, perhaps you should say the green zone. So what has happened is uh, money has not succeeded in what is called the 3D uh, strategy, uh, defense, diplomacy and development. The things have not merged. Um, India under influence of Americans have also pledged billions of dollars in developmental aid in Afghanistan. Uh, Indian Foreign Service officer has lost his life in an attack on Indian Embassy. So what has happened is that if you put down money and the terrorists destroy whatever infrastructural uh, developments have taken place, it is like a hole in the bucket. You can't rectify that. And also in these 20-25 years, a whole generation of Afghani youngsters have grown up who have not known a peace, who have had to live with uh, warring warlords and who are not sure whether their lives are secure, their rights are secure in Afghanistan. There have been targeted attacks by Taliban even when they are into negotiations and it was, you know, President Obama who started this myth of saying that there are good Taliban and there are bad Taliban and if you could we can choose between good and bad Taliban according to American national interest. This may not coincide with the interest of the other parties concerned. So like the women in Afghanistan are very worried that once the Taliban come back, it will be a matter of time when the regime in Kabul falls because it is supported entirely by American troops. Uh, their personal physical safety is guaranteed by that and they, the, the supply of funds which comes is the Americans. So once the Americans decide that their vital interests are not involved in Afghanistan and they move out of Afghanistan, take out the troops and the supply of developmental aid also dries up because nobody would be sure even if the Americans or the other nations give uh, economic or technological aid to Afghanistan, is it going to be administered properly or is it also going to be drained away, siphoned away in corruption. So there is something which India has to keep in mind, which the United States has to keep in mind, but then it leaves us with a very, very tricky situation. I think Biden's decision cannot be faulted because Biden has finally realized that this is an unwinnable war. And like America retreated from the Vietnamese quagmire, uh, trying to save its face, here 
the face saving uh, is given a gloss but it also is an acceptance of defeat. He says that so far we have postponed the dates of American withdrawal from Kabul hoping that better circumstances would prevail. But we can't wait for an ideal situation. They, they, it may never appear. So it is better to leave Afghanistan's, Afghanis people to settle their differences among themselves. Now, this is one part. The second part about the Afghan uh, crisis is how is this decision of the Americans is likely to impact on others. In short run, Pakistanis think that they control the Taliban. Uh, they would think that they have got uh, advantage vis-a-vis -vis India. Pakistanis think that they need the strategic depth of uh, Afghanistan to countervail Indian weight and influence in this uh, subcontinent. Indians have been, uh, keep been chasing a mirage, thinking that if they control Afghanistan or have influence on the regime in Kabul, they can have a pincer-like uh, pressure on the Pakistanis. The Indians cannot forget that whenever there is a large-scale influx of refugees from Afghanistan to Pakistan, drug trafficking, illicit arms, Pakistanis have played the victim card and have tried to get support from Americans saying that we are victims of terrorism. And keeping the American strategic interests in mind, the Chi Pakistanis have played both the Chinese and the Americans uh, to the disadvantage of the Indians. But in the long run, now much has changed even in Taliban. There are Talibans who are not willing to be controlled or managed by the Pakistanis. They are independent. There are factions therein. And once they know that they are on the victorious side, the Americans have almost surrendered by saying that they are withdrawing. They know it is a matter of time before they can take on Kabul. And there are the bottlenecks in the talks are quite obvious, whether it is an Islamic Republic, uh, which is Islamic Emirate, which is going to be established in Kabul, or a less dogmatic, less fundamentalist, is difficult to imagine secular, but a regime which respects the rights of women it has more or less some kind of inclination towards uh, forming a responsible, responsive government is not very likely. So as far as Pakistanis are concerned, they can't be very sure that once in control in Kabul, Taliban would be willing to be led by them. That's one part. This might lead to another influx of uh, refugees to Pakistan, which Pakistan might find it difficult to cope. Now the relationship is with America is also changing. The Americans may not be willing to yield to the victim's card argument and Pakistan might not lose this. How is this going to affect the Chinese interest? The Chinese interests are vitally uh, about the China-Pakistan economic corridor and this is important because stability in Afghanistan is necessary for this. Interestingly, the Russians would be happy to realize that the Americans have found themselves in, even in a more humiliating situation and their options are more or less limited. Now, one of the major um, points of irritation between uh, President Biden's America and Putin's Russia is that uh, information has surfaced that the Russians were giving a bounty to Afghan terrorist Afghan Taliban to kill American soldiers in uniform in Afghanistan. Now, the Russians, of course, have denied that, but Afghanistan allows one more card to Russia to play vis-a-vis -vis America. Interestingly, what has happened is Turkey has offered that it would, you know, be around to mediate between different warring parties. Iranians cannot remain indifferent to it because their port of Gwadar is very close to whatever is happening. Uh, and also they share a border with, uh, share a border with Afghanistan. Uh, other Central Asian republics like Tajikistan are there. There are Tajiks, part of the population of Afghanistan. There are Hajaras, there are Uzbeks. So there are these relationships of Afghanistan. All this becomes confronted with a question mark. Now, how does India cope with this? India has so far apparently put all its eggs in one basket with the government in Kabul. So at times it is Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, at times it is under the advice of Americans, Dr. Ashraf Ghani, before that was Hamid Karzai. There seems to be loss of way somewhere in Afghanistan. You might, uh, our Indians might make bold statements that we are vitally interested in whatever is happening in Afghanistan, but India cannot forget that India was not invited to the multinational co conference which was organized by Russia and the Russians, time-tested friends of India supposedly, uh, did not include India here. 
and the Americans asked India to join in. But the point is, in, under the present circumstances, when India is joining Quad is more certainly more discernibly in the American camp, uh, Indian interests in Afghanistan are not likely to be given a priority by any of the major powers, neither America nor Russia. Of course, China is out of question and Pakistan would be happy. So in this case, India has to worry about Afghanistan for a long number of years to come. It is part of the SARC. We have had historical ties during freedom movement of the frontier Gandhi, the Bakhtuns and the Patans. But there again, we have these uh, mythical recollections of past that Kabuliwala came to India, the famous story of Ravinna Tagore. And we have, you know, the kind that a Patan doesn't go back on his word and so on and so forth. But this is not exactly accurate. One should not forget that from Ahmad Shah Abdali to Nadir Shah, the invaders who plundered India have come through Afghanistan and there are memories which are bitter, there are memories uh, which are happy uh, but uh, foreign policy cannot be conducted only on the basis of memories so we have to look at the change world and plan prospectively. President Putin of Russia has specialized, one might even say he has a special knack of surprising the Western powers, particularly the United States of America, by his sudden decisions and catching them on the wrong foot. What has happened recently is that he amassed almost 100,000 troops on the Ukrainian border and this seems to threaten the survival of the Ukrainian government. There has been a long history of Russians trying to destabilize Ukraine, especially by appealing to the eastern part of the Ukraine, where uh, lots of people of Russian origin are citizens. They claim that they are being persecuted by the Ukrainians. The Russians do not uh, trust the Ukrainian government because they think it has been trying to draw closer to NATO and allowing NATO to come close to the sensitive borders of Russia. So, and since ever since the Russians annexed Crimea, uh, the whole world has looked with great apprehension to Russian expansionist designs. They think that Putin is trying to undo uh, the unraveling of the Soviet Empire. He is trying to win back the countries in Eastern Europe, either through persuasion or through coercion, to join the Russian camp once again. Uh, there also has been some concern because the Russians and the Chinese have drawn closer to each other in recent past. So there seems to be a recurrence of the socialist resurgence of the socialist bloc. Uh, it may not be truly socialist anymore. It may not be ideologically motivated. But in pure geopolitical terms, there would be a bloc of Russia and China which would be confronting uh, the United States of America, NATO and the European Union. Now, the interesting part is this, that the American president came out very hard hitting, with a very hard hitting statement against Putin. Uh, some time back he called him a killer, so he has been criticizing him constantly for suppression of human rights, for persecutions of political opponents like Navalny, trying to murder them. Russians of course have denied all these allegations. Uh, there have been uh, reports in American and the Western press about uh, the untold wealth, unimaginable wealth of the Russian president. There is an definite effort to malign and defame the Russian president. Now, but it is not only a question of psychological warfare. The interesting thing is that the analysts have been confused because Biden seems to be blowing hot and cold. He called Putin a killer. He asked him to almost threaten him to back off in Ukraine, uh, take back his uh, forces. But at the same time, he offered him a summit meeting. He said that America is very keen to normalize relations uh, and cooperate with Russia. There are areas of cooperation which are important like the climate change, like the renegotiation and extension of the START treaty about nuclear weapons, reducing the nuclear stockpile of the two countries. And also there are other concerns. The climate change is important because the Russian activities in the Arctic region have caused concern. Uh, the change in because of industrialization, because of uh, human intervention in remote areas of Siberia have led to the ending of permafrost, change in temperature. And all this is likely to impact not only in Russia, but the rest of the world. In short term, Russians might love the extension of the summer. Russians might love the strategic superiority in the the Arctic region, but then the whole world should take a decision. If Arctic is to be 
developed quote unquote in certain manner what would be the precautions that should be taken is the, is is the kind of chinese blind to all environmental negotiations and trying to extend their influence in the antarctic so there is one climate change is important to discuss with russia the use of fossil fuels and carbon emissions is very important to deal with russia russia's support to factions which are antagonistic to america in syria is important russian intervention elsewhere in libya and middle east is important and it is hilarious that now the turks and the russians ever since azerbaijan and armenian conflict seem to be on the same side there is no major disagreement with that so also the thing which confuses everybody is uh, there is no unanimity among the european nations about how to deal with uh, russia the french and the germans two major actors in uh, european union are less hard hitting about russia than the american president there are reasons for this the american president has one other major grievance about russia it says that the russians have been launching cyber attacks on uh, american businesses like snow winds and also been trying to use cyber attacks to interfere with american internal politics democratic processes uh, even the presidential elections and they some analysts believe that the trump was so severely compromised by his association with the russians help he had received uh, the emails which were leaked to defame uh, hillary clinton that he could not take a tough stance against the russians and the russians of course deny all these allegations and they also said that the americans have been trying to do a similar kind of this uh, cyber attacks on them now whatever may be the truth the biden did two things which have caused concern he expelled 10 diplomats Um, uh, russian diplomats from america there is a tit, tit for tat process the russians uh, expelled 10 american diplomats but the biden regime also said this is an emergency we can't allow our democracy to be sabotaged so they imposed new sanctions on russia now russia has already been hurt by american sanctions imposed earlier which trumps did not pursue with great vigor but they had been there before now it is not like a trade war with china but the russian economy has suffered because of this but the russians are supremely confident that they will not blink under putin for this kind of a blackmail because it is a double edged sword the economic sanctions might upset destabilize the russian economy the value of the ruble might be devalued but this might encourage russian exports including uh, its defense weapons uh, exports so this would be uh, probably hurting america certainly american economic sanctions also come with a very strange qualification that any other country dealing with uh, russians would also be vulnerable to these sanctions so the russians believe that it impinges on their democratic rights to trade and deal with whoever they deal with and russians are not exactly like uh, uh, venezuela or even iran has not succumbed to american sanctions so the chances are that the economic sanctions will not do much so the americans may be posturing americans may be trying to uh, convey to putin that they will support their uh, nato allies they will come to the defense of uh, ukraine there is a relationship in the global perspective the chinese are threatening to annex taiwan and reunite it with the mainland uh, the americans keep saying that they will come to the aid they will they have, they repeat about ukraine ukraine has said that either its membership of the nato and european union should be fast tracked or it should be given nuclear weapons now these are both pipe dreams but the fact is that are we witnessing the beginning of a new cold war with the potential of an explosion into the third world war or are we seeing a replay of the munich appeasement scenario where you put your trust on a piece of paper you think that you have bought peace for your time but ultimately you have postponed for a very small time uh, the salami slicing of an opponent who's authoritarian who's reckless who's adventurous what impact will this have on india's foreign policy is interesting because india was planning to buy s400 missiles from russia india continues to buy certain defense uh, equipment from russia russians are not too happy about indians diversifying its uh, defense purchases from fighter aircraft from france to uh, defense purchases from israel but the russians are not going to treat india as a prime consideration in its relationship with with the united states of america so there is a hard rock 
and a very difficult place on the other side. So Biden would also have to make a decision that how he is going to deal with Putin. This is all we have for you this week. But before we conclude, I think it is worth our while to recap what we have mentioned in this review. I think two things are causing some concern in Indian foreign policy making circles. Uh, the first is that there are developments in the immediate neighborhood, in the subcontinent itself, where things are changing not necessarily in our interest. They are almost adverse to our interest. And we are not in a position to make an intervention to redress the imbalance. In Afghanistan, for instance, the situation remains in flux, but India is today in a far lesser effective position to influence developments, forget about the rest of Afghanistan, but in Kabul itself. It is basically going to be an extremely interesting tug of war between America after the withdrawal, but America has made it very clear that its vital interests are not involved in Afghanistan. It will move Europe words, it will be more concerned about Crimea, Ukraine, uh, Russian combative postures uh, towards its NATO allies. Uh, Americans, Biden promised, would not withdraw like Trump from international affairs, but would play a more uh, dynamic, more active role. But then, does this mean that America would be less unilateralist, more multilateralist now? If you have a look at the European Union, you realize that vis-a-vis -vis Russia, uh, the French and the Germans have a far more resilient, far more softer line uh, than America. The only ally in the Atlantic Alliance which is pro-America uh, equally hard is Boris Johnson's Britain, but it is itself beset with difficulties with Brexit, with the crisis in Ireland, which we'll discuss soon enough. And slowly the focus has shifted in Afghanistan from, from Afghanistan, as far as America is concerned, to things, events elsewhere. Uh, now, as far as India is concerned, it cannot write of Afghanistan. But its capacity, its capability to influence development there, there is constantly shrinking. It has to worry about the instability which might occur in Pakistan due to these changes. It might worry about the spillover effect of ideologically or fundamentalist a dogmatic, intolerant interpretation of Islam in the Indian population, Indian Islamic population, and how would they react to it? If the Islamic Emirate is established in Afghanistan, would it have a link with ISIS? Would it have a link with Al-Qaeda by this name or any other name? These uh, hydra-headed snakes are raising their hoods in Africa, and there is a possibility of a greater linkage between these, these elements. Uh, India has suffered because of the spillover from Afghanistan to Pakistan to Kashmir, so we have to be on our guard. We also have to worry about the instability in the subcontinent on the other side of the border, where Myanmar is in no way uh, heading towards uh, a peace or resolution of the crisis there. So India has to worry about that and worry about its interest, realizing that maybe we have to hold back for the time being, but do what? Can we also try to balance it elsewhere. We thought we could do it vis-a-vis -vis China with Quad, but the recent American uh, gunboat diplomacy in the Arabian Sea has raised doubts about that issue also. We have had very close relationship with Russia in past, but Russians have again shifted focus from Eurasia to Europe, to, towards the European front. So if Putin decides to give uh, greater importance to Ukraine, to East European countries which had one, were once part of the Soviet Empire, then there is little scope that Soviets would treat India as a special case and give it a special primacy. This is particularly disturbing because the Russians and the Chinese, for a variety of reasons, have come closer to each other. Uh, so this is a kind of emergence of forces, realignment of power equations. However, uh, great self-confidence may be there in the South Block cannot be justified very easily. So we will advise you to keep this in mind, keep track of these changes and try to examine the linkages till we meet again next week. Thank you.